Hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of Paratalk and on this episode I have a returning guest. I have Rob from Dead Air, the YouTube channel, the investigator himself. How are you doing Rob? I'm good thanks, bit of deja vu being back but yeah. always happy to be on here <laughs> again. Well we, yeah, I um, uh, I thought I was looking for my list of, uh, of contacts and I thought Rob, I haven't had Rob on an episode and I really enjoyed our, our last uh, episode we did. And we had a good old uh, conversation about all things about what you've been up to. And because uh, you've been kind of like uh, uh, busy with your investigations recently and you've done, you, you know, you've done a, quite a lot of uh, new stuff and new content, which uh, goes up on your YouTube channel, which I highly recommend. Yeah. Of course, links will be in the description with this uh, with this episode. But um, I was going to uh, ask you now your most recent um, video was uh, done in the Channel Islands. Uh, yeah. you know the underground hospital the german underground hospital was over there so the, before we rush ahead and start talking about it the channel islands what well, for for anyone that doesn't come from england or from france what are the channel islands well they're a group of islands and there's a lot more, i found out when i went there's a lot more of them than i thought there were there's lots of smaller ones as well um that are i would say crown dependencies of britain so they're kind mm -hmm. of part of the british isles but they're they've got their own flags they've got their own currency they've got yeah. their own um way of life their own culture essentially but at the end of the day they still were um, they're still british um they speak english over there um but they're just off the coast of france so yeah. they're sort of closer to continental europe than actual britain itself so a lot of people go over there will so it just felt like being in northern France. You've got the same scenery. You get the nice weather um, due to the location, the way they're uh, located just off the that northern, northwestern bay in the Normandy area. So they get a lot of nice weather over there. And um, it's all like was mentioned earlier before we came on air, the, the roads. It's it, You'd have to go there and experience mm. oh, it. Oh, yeah. It's, it's an interesting place, full it, of history. It is. Yeah. It is. Um, I mean, yeah. When when I was um when I was a teenager, uh, I was quite fortunate to. It was my parents' um favorite holiday destination, and we went over there a, a couple of times. And uh, it was it was interesting because it was kind of this dual. You yet you should tell you, you thought at some point you thought you were in France, but you would then you thought, well, no, I'm in England, but I'm in France, but I mean, and it's that kind of dual sort of thing. Where some people would talk French, the signs would be in French. You'd have French shops, you'd have English shops quite an interesting way to sort of uh to live you know on an island and i'd say they they do their own thing they have their own rules and regulations and their own money and stuff like that but it is and, and of course you get the nice weather as well and you do get that kind of really kind of nice warm weather over there for for a bit longer than what we get so anyway so yeah but it, they played a part in the the second world war and those yeah. those islands yeah. were well, they were landed by the Germans in the Second World War, and they were taken over, and they were ruled for what, a number of years, weren't they? Um, and obviously, after the war, there was a lot of relics and stuff that were left over. And two of them, one on the one island called Guernsey, and the second island, Jersey, which are the two largest ones. And um, they had uh, underground facilities, bases like hospitals and barracks and stuff. Your latest video you go to Guernsey and you do an investigation. How did that, I mean, because not anyone can do that. So how did, for you, yeah. how did that come about? I'm really into travel. So 
every year I'm always away. I'm two or three times a year. I'm picking different places to go to. And we had lockdown in 2020. And I was just sitting there on the laptop looking at places to go to. I was aware that going abroad might not happen for quite a while. And I was looking for places to go to within the UK that I could possibly go and have a, a break, have a holiday in. And the Channel Islands came up. I looked at it. That looks like an interesting place. And I'm, you know, the first place I looked at was was actually Jersey itself. Yeah. Um, got a little travel guide from the from the bookshop. It's just a little pocket guide. Sat and read it. I thought this place sounds incredible. Read about the the facilities there, the the museums that were over there, and the fact that it had a lot of history with like the occupational side of it, which mm-hmm. sounded incredible. So my original idea was that would be a, a, an interesting place to go to. And I could look at maybe seeing if there's anywhere I could like record any types of content while I'm over there. Um, I like the idea that some of the well-known TV shows that do the paranormal investigations don't really go out there. They're kind of more on the mainland. And I thought there's so much out there. The first plan was to look at, um, in Jersey, they've got, you've got the big castle yeah. that overlooks the towns of Elizabeth Castle, I think it's called. Um, and I thought that would be an interest. You could see it. You could see the thumbnail. You could see everything. I thought the, the scenery, sort of overlooking the, the little port. And then it started to sort of go on, and I realised it was, the, you know, the, the World War Two things that were still there, like the underground hospital and all the, the gun batteries and lookout towers that just all over these islands. Um, looked into the Jersey Hospital first. Wasn't really getting anywhere with that, although they were probably, you know, closed and mm. going through a difficult time with, with the pandemic being on. And um, so it sort of went under the back foot and didn't really do anything with it for a while. And then uh, sometime last year, um, I'd been looking into it again and I I didn't realise that there was another almost identical uh, hospital over on Guernsey, yeah. which is the next, well, it's the second largest island in the Channel Islands. Um, and I've realized that they were a little bit more paranormal friendly. They've had people that have gone across before and done public events over there. Um, so I thought straight away, the content creator side kicks in and you think strip, it's ticking all the boxes. It's Mm. not been featured on television shows. The stories are quite new and there's a lot to tap. So people aren't going to go there and just immediately you know, know everything about the place. There, there'll be a lot. And if you've watched the videos that I do, I like to spend a lot of time at the start yeah. doing the history of the place. And I thought that there's so much there. In the end, there was so much I had to leave out because it, it, I could have talked for hours about the history of the island, the, his, the history of the tunnels, everything. Um, so as it turns out, there's about 60 miles of underground tunnels in the Channel Island wow. that were built by the Germans. All these concrete reinforced tunnels some of them under churches some of them were hospitals some of them were submarine bases that were going to they they, at one point i think the channel islands were the most fortified place in the world during world war ii Mm. because hitler himself adolf hitler looked at them and thought this was he was thinking long term he didn't realize the war was only going to last for five years and then um there would give up the islands he thought this was going to be a german island for you know after the war forever this was going to be a holiday destination there was plans that the the, german people were going to go there it was going to be a holiday destination so they built this underground hospital and it wasn't just a hospital with a few room with a few rooms it had operating theaters wards mortuaries kitchens um it had its own water supply this was a fully functioning hospital that was built into almost two miles of underground tunnels, all reinforced with with concrete. This was bomb-proof. They had secret entrances that were going in and out. This place was, you know, incredible. But if you go there now and you stand in the village where it is or you walk above it, it's just a, a normal village. The yeah, you'd have no fields, idea. You don't know it's there. Yeah, you'd have and no it's idea. one of the largest Nazi megastructures ever built is in this village and people probably wouldn't realize it i know we've got a tv show in the uk um nazi megastructures that used to show these 
facilities that they built, but they were always like in France or Germany. And to think that the largest one they ever built was actually within the British Isles. And a lot of people didn't know that. So from a, a content point of view, that was something I really wanted to focus on and make the video and try and surprise people at the start and make people think that well, this is just a normal, looks like a normal British village with this inside of it. it that blew my mind just going there and, and, and doing it from that point of view. So did you just sort of uh, drop them an email or ring them up and say, can I, uh, can I come and have a, you know, can I search for some ghosts in your, in, in, the, in a building? Or was it more of a, a kind of, did they have to kind of vet you and make sure that you were kind of legit? Because you, you were in there on, you know, this, your, your video of your investigation is on your YouTube channel and you're literally in yeah. there on your own. You know? Yeah. So I got in touch with a guy called Tim Brown. He ran a parent, but still runs a paranormal group called Pigs. If you know um, Kieran O'Keefe from yeah. Most Haunted, they're quite good friends. Uh, Kieran goes on quite a lot of the, their public investigations. I know that this guy has links to the hospital himself. Um, and that weekend, they were going to be doing their own public event. So I knew that he had access to it at that time. So I was able to get access. Ah. Sort of cool. on it outside of their event so they were doing it on the either the friday night or the saturday night but he had access to be able to have access to the tunnels the doors would be open um and it was i was going to go along and, and meet him anyway i met him for another event that they were doing in guernsey as well um and he said yeah you can have a couple of hours um you know there'll be nobody in the tunnels for a while There'll be people setting up maybe outside, but there you go. You've got it, the whole place to yourself. And then obviously I came back another day and filmed all the external stuff and daytime stuff at another time. So I usually do that anyway. I film the ghost hunt itself with the night vision and then come back and reshoot different things on another another time. So just to put into context, these um, these giant underground bases, the one on Guernsey and the one on Jersey, um they were they were built by prisoners of war slave labor yeah. basically forced labor and uh one of the things that made me stop and and really take into context i mean i, I was a teenager when i went there the first time and my parents took me to the jersey underground uh hospital and um was there was a huge pile of shoes from all these uh uh people who had been you know prisoners of war had been forced labored over there and uh shoes that have been left and shoes that have been lost mm -hmm. or people that have died and that that to give you a context of how many people had had been involved in building these places and it was there must have been thousands of pairs of shoes there or thousands of shoes so that's how many people it took to build these uh these massive structures and so uh, when i when when you think of the paranormal and you think of places like this you always think what is the emotional connection uh what could literally imprint on this build ever there was never really a conflict there there was never really n nobody fought anyone i mean i still find it amazing that the the british never had bases over there to protect them because it's an ideal jumping off point to england if you wanted to invade england you could have an you've got airports there you've got seaports you know you could <laughs> it, yes, yes. it's a no-brainer really i just i and they look at the channel lines well it's, they're not really they're not really a problem so uh, yeah i think they were but then then again but anyway that's history we're talking about the past so if you look at those kind of buildings all right and you look at the amount of people that were involved with it and as i say emotionally imprinting if you're forced to do something you don't want to do and you're having to do it and, and if you lose your life or or whatever um i'm thinking those places would be kind of ideal even though they didn't see any conflict there's there's still an emotional uh imprint on them from the people that were that built them basically that the the people that had to do the hard graft and and make those places so what when you did your um you know your kind of draft of what you were going to do what was in your mind what were you going to investigate what were you looking for that was the difficult thing because I'd read stories about people saying, and it, it, you come across the cliches. Mm. So I knew straight away before I even opened a, a book or looked at anything that what I was going to come across. So it's the German soldier wearing Nazi uniform. Yeah. 
you've seen in there a lot and you think is that a cliche is that someone who's just said it because it's the obvious thing that you would expect to see when you're down there and of course someone said that you see someone who's dressed in dirty tatty overalls who looks like they've been working there possibly as a slave and again you think how much has someone just made that up because they've been influenced by mm -hmm. what the, the location is um so i had that going on um so it, you kind of go in there with an open mind so you kind of have to exclude that and think to yourself you've got to go in there neutral and essentially start with a blank page so whatever i experience is kind of without putting things into anyone's head so there were times where you did hear little noises down there which there is a lot of environmental issues with echo and things dripping down so you do hear things which means you have to stop talking and, and sort of try and listen a little bit but i didn't want to say could that be a german soldier walking towards me could that be a a nurse prisoner of war wherever you, you kind of go in there and just sort of be neutral about it and to see what you get and who you get um but for me it was the second time i went in that i it really hit me in terms of like the emotional side of it in the daytime someone pointed at something on the floor and he said have you noticed this before and i looked on the because it's all a, a concrete floor mm -hmm. and there's footprints in the within the concrete and you, you sort of crouch down, so you look, uh, get down on your on your knees, and you look at it. And he says, "That one there, that was made by a German officer." And you can tell because he's wearing a boot. But then you look at this one over here. You point it to another one, maybe three or four meters further on. So you look, that's you can tell whoever put that footprint there wasn't wearing a boot on their foot. That was just that would have been a prisoner of war. And then mm. you, that kind of. Yeah. As soon as I saw that, and these aren't, it's, you know, it's a museum, but this is an original footprint. You can touch it. You yeah. can put your hand on it. That was made by, and he, he, that was when it kind of, to me, it was Comes kind of, real. And that was, that was after I'd done the investigation. Um, and I think, yeah, we, at, at the Guernsey hospital, we didn't have things like the, the pile of shoes. You kind of go in the door, there's a reception desk. And then you go through another door and there's like some mannequins behind glass cases mm -hmm. and some things in glass uh, cabinets. But then you go into the hospital and it's just bare walls. Um, and it's a lot of it's just how it's been found. It's been abandoned for a few decades and then they've only recently reopened it as a museum attraction. Um, and I, I think I get the impression the Jersey one's more of a museum. So there's more. Yeah, there's um, a lot of stuff in there. Yeah. yeah. There is a lot of stuff yeah. in the Jersey one. So, so we didn't see that anything like the, the shoes that you mentioned, mm. but um, I think I read a, a stat that there was something like 20,000 prisoner uh, prisoners of war died on the Channel Islands during the, the five years of the occupation, which um, you don't realise how small the Channel Islands are until you go there. You realise that the islands, you can drive around them in um, under half an hour. Yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah. I think from end to end that well i think jersey is like eight miles or something like that it's not it's not huge yeah uh but it's all like little little you know windy little roads through woods and stuff it's it's very um yeah it's very magical i mean it's very quaint but it's uh it's not it's not massive but there's a there's an awful lot of um content on those i mean you, you if you were if you were dropped there in the middle of nowhere you'd think that you were in a small village somewhere a small town but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not it's not huge hugely busy, and I think that's why they're quite uh, protective about you know having too many li people living on the island. They are quite restrictive, and you have to have certain yeah. uh, financial yeah. levels to, to 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 live there and stuff. But by the by, you know, neither of us neither of us are in a position to move to Jersey, so we'll <laughs> just forget that. Yeah, I, I did look when I was there, um, and one of my tour guides shot the idea down straight away and said that there's <laughs> a very limited housing that's yeah a bit that's kept aside for people from the mainland to come and then even when you're there there's criteria that you've you've got to match and then um and obviously the expense that comes after that yep. so yeah so when you um got eventually got into the building and thought okay gonna do an investigation uh i'm gonna see what i can capture what was your um you know 
what was your plan of action? Did you think, well, I'm going to go for EVP? I'm going to try and go for apparitions? Because it's a big place. So you've got yeah. limited time. So how did you how did you sort of use that time as wisely as possible? I think I was trying to be quite open to various things. So um, I had to be quite picky about what I took um, in terms of what I could physically take because I had to fly there. So I couldn't take everything I wanted to take on the plane. But I, I got the SLS camera through. I got um, all my camera stuff through. That was okay. Um, so I think the first part, because I tried to, um, I fall into the trap of trying to please the different groups of people. There's some people who prefer the back to basics investigations where it's eyes and ears. So I tried to do a little bit of that for the first part. So I spent, um, obviously it was edited down, but I spent about an hour, maybe just under an hour, just trying to see what kind of environmental things were coming through um, in terms of was I going to hear footsteps? Was I going to hear or see apparitions, which I think would have been the, the thing you would you would go for if you if you could pick. Um, very box for that. Yeah. Um, absolutely nothing came through that. In fact, I did have a, it, it shut down on me on one point. I was going to say, was yeah, you had a bit of a weird moment, didn't you, with that? Yeah, it shut down, which it's never done before. And I know that I hadn't pressed the button, but then it, it was fine again, but nothing came through it. It was just white noise. I wasn't even getting any radio bleed coming through it. So after about 20 minutes, I was, you know, this, this isn't working. So I kind of gave up on that, moved on, over to the next one, tried to use a voice bank that had sounds in, which might encourage a little bit more. If, if I know they're quite a controversial subject, I'm still sitting on the fence on them. Um, and it was funny, I did hear things that sounded German, like German sounds, whether I was being influenced by the fact I knew where I was. So I wasn't taking it as being concrete proof, but noted it in the video that did sound a little bit like German word, like ish, it's like a word for I'm. Yeah. Um, and I thought I heard the word Czech come through as well, given that there were prisoners of war that would have been Czech, um, Polish, Russian. Um, but I thought I would use that as a way of trying to capture any voices that would come through, given that the spirit box wasn't giving me any results. So I thought, give it another platform, see if that would work. Um, again, I think everyone has a different view on on the voice bank. Some people yeah. think they're, they're brilliant. Some people think, well, how can a spirit manipulate um, a bit of code within an electronic device? which is kind of like how I've always thought about it. But I use it anyway just to see if I can capture anything that could be used as being, well, that's a bit odd. Um, and then finally tried using an SLS camera, didn't really get anything through that either. So I think in terms of whether I, I captured anything paranormal, I probably didn't. The, the strangest thing was probably the spirit box switching itself off. I also had a, a REM pod that was switched off as well when I went back to it, which I thought I'd had switched on. I usually switch it on and test it and then walk away. I came back to it and the actual switch in the, underneath the REM pod, there's an on-off switch so it can't just switch off on its own. Um, I think I mentioned it in the video, but I didn't make too much of a big deal because I don't want to be one of those people that's like blaming um, equipment failures on the paranormal, but yeah. I did mention I thought that was on before and then switched it back on. But whether I did or not, I didn't. I wasn't recording myself when I set everything up, so I couldn't use that and I couldn't go back and use that as proof. If I had, I would have been able to straight away use the two clips and say, "Well, look, here's a clip of me switching it on. Here's a clip of me going back and finding that the thing's off." Um, so I, I kind of looked at it i thought no you can't really use that that's clutching at straws a little bit it could be power not but it, it could you know the likelihood is it probably wasn't switched on in the first place but overall there were a couple of times i did think i heard noises but again environmental conditions in that place the walls were soaking wet the ceilings were soaking wet there was a lot of condensation around i was finding that when i was talking I was getting mists coming through on the screen, which yeah. I didn't even think about until I was watching the footage back. Even though I'm looking at the whole thing through a, a small screen on the camera, 
you don't really notice the the amount of mist that you you produce until you see it on a, a bigger screen. And when I watched back, I thought the first time I thought, oh, what was that? Second time, it's, oh, it's every time I talk. And then you, you, suddenly you, you're watching it, thinking with your hand over your face, thinking how much I was producing, how, how much mist was in that tunnel. And then you look back at photographs that people have taken in there that show mists in the morgue, things like that. And I was kind of a little bit like. I've, I've debunked it in a way. So I was, I, I made a point of mentioning that the photo that a lot of people believed was paranormal because it was taken in a morgue and there was a lot of mist in the air in front of the person taking the photograph. And then I thought, well, I'll use the fact that I've captured a lot of it as a way of maybe saying, look, this is a, a possible explanation to debunking that as has been you know it probably was missed I, I mentioned probably i don't want to completely rule it out but i did say this was more than likely to be uh, the mist of somebody talking that was picked that was picked up in the flash of of someone's iphone probably so um i was able to kind of debunk something that had been going around on on the internet i think i hope so anyway well i was gonna um say that uh when you go into a, a building, an underground structure like that, um, you, immediately the temperature is going to drop uh, by a yeah. number of degrees. You're going to, you know, from the outside, because obviously it's, a, it's underground, it's stone or, you know, it, it just, I live in an old house, I know it gets cold. And um, you're going to get condensation as you speak, you're going to get condensation and uh, out of your mouth and yeah. because you're, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a little heated person walking around. And that does, you know, when you have a camera and you take a picture and if you take a picture with flash, you're going to get that kind of mist effect. And the best way to take pictures in those environments is don't use flash. Just, you know, yeah. turn your ISO up on the, on the camera and don't use flash. Just use the, 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 the available light. Obviously, sometimes you can't. Well, then just use, you know, it's photographing areas you can or use, you know, night vision. So... What I was going to say was, uh, when you were kind of in the in that environment, it's very difficult to, uh, if you capture something, to say, oh, I've, you know, this is paranormal evidence. We, we, as we know, we, we're both were aware that the, the paranormal is very rare, and when it does happen, it might happen, and you are completely unaware that it ha has happened. So when you're in that kind of environment, and you think you hear a voice, or you think you capture something, um, and you've got water dripping, You've got uh, air moving through the tunnels. Uh, you know, you, you can be you can be tricked, and your your mind yeah. is where, where our brains are programmed to make sense from things that don't seem to make sense. And sometimes we can, you know, we're not when we're, we're fallible. We're not we're not perfect. When when you're in there, um, do you find that having using maybe two cameras and two different uh, microphones to capture? You know, one camera at one end of the room, another camera at the other end of the room, uh, and one microphone at one end of the room, a microphone at the other end of the room, as they bo both capture the same thing, this, then there's chance that that is some form of phenomenon. It might not be, yeah. but it's kind of it, it kind of verifies that whatever's there is there, and it's not just a uh, you know an anomaly of that device you're using. Do you, do you find that that is a a valid thing, and and do you use anything like that? Locked off cameras before. Um, but I think one of the reasons I haven't done it is simply um, the the time and having to go through all of the extra additional footage and having yeah. an extra camera around. So usually I've filmed the ghost hunt in a kind of point of view, so it's kind of like people can watch it as if it's my eyes. But like your perspective, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I get what you're saying, and I've got microphones I could use, which could be used in future paranormal investigations um although when we talk about evps one of the things that i've often like thought to myself when you you watch a lot of paranormal tv shows when they, they have the little mp3 recorders in their hands and they'll, mm. they'll say they'll ask a question is so and so here then they play it back and instantly you've got this whispery voice that always comes through and the, the question i was thinking is well the cameras that they're using has a built-in recorder anyway and it records in mp3 so i have a, my theory behind it was why would one pick up 
if, if it's in the same hand or it's in the same area of two or three meters why would why one would pick up a sound that the other one wouldn't unless they were sort of located in different parts of the building or yeah then we'd say well, is a spirit manipulating or able to project itself into one recorder only and not the other one and um, which is one of the things i've always looked at a lot of these tv shows and and sort of scratched my head a little bit about um especially when it comes to handheld recorders that you'd hold in your hand whilst you're also videoing in the same in the same area well rob um i might have an answer or a okay. not not and not it's not definitive nothing is definitive opinions but um as someone who's studied EVP, and that's kind of uh, something that I was super, super interested in many years ago, still have a, a great interest in it because it fascinates me as, bit, as well as ITC. Um, but anyway, so we go to the theory of you raise a valid point. If you've got a recorder in your hand and you say, is anyone there? And then suddenly this voice comes back and you think, wow, there's something there. Something's trying to talk to me. And then you've got this mm-hmm. uh, thousand pound DSLR in your hand and you're we're doing recording, it's got a built, built-in stereo microphone and, you know, and nothing's on there. Nobody's talking yeah. on there. So what's going on? So the argument is, okay, the argument is that the, um, the little 30-pound handheld recorder has got a very low-quality, uh, cheap preamp, okay? And the uh, DSLR that you've got has got a much higher-quality preamp. And that's a preamp is, for anyone that's not technically-minded, the preamp is the the thing that amplifies the sound and puts the sound on the chip. Very very basic terms. Yes. Yeah. Now uh, the handheld recorder has got a very cheap version of that, and the uh, camera has got a very uh, higher quality, more expensive version. The higher quality one is is able to filter out more background noise. It, it's able to get rid of anything, uh, get rid of the nonsense, and only capture what you, what you're what you want to be on there as where the cheaper one doesn't have any of that filtering ability. It just records everything. So mm-hmm. the theory is, the, uh, the, the, the saying is out there that these, the cheaper the recorders are easier for the energies, whatever they are, spirits, uh, personalities, whatever, to imprint on because there's less filtering. Now, whether, they, you know, whether a, um, a discarnate uh, consciousness knows that and thinks, well, I'm going to talk to this instead of that, or it's just luck that these, the, you know, because th- this is the way I, I, I look at things. This is how my brain works. As weird as it sounds, I, I believe that when you're, if, if you are a consciousness and you're floating around, okay, uh, you haven't got a mouth. You haven't got a vocal. You can't vocalize anything. You can't talk. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But what yeah. you, all you can do is mentally imprint. And to mentally imprint on something, you need to have energy. And to, and for energy to, uh, to imprint on something, you need to have a, 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 a burst of energy. So, for example, they're in, a, uh, they're in a place and they go, oh, my batteries have gone flat. Maybe that's the, uh, the, the, you know, the disembodied entity is uh, taking that energy so it can imprint onto a device. I don't know, but maybe. And maybe the cheaper devices are more susceptible to being imprinted on because they, they're not able to filter out all the background noise. And that's why they work. And that's why people get these voices on those. I don't know. When I started yeah. off doing EVP, I started off doing it with cassette. It was all analog. And I used to use white noise and generate white noise from a sound generator. And, uh, and I had voices. And, and I did it for a long time, a long time. And I recorded, uh, in all of the time I did it, I only ever recorded two voices that were that sounded like they were in the room with me, uh, physically speaking to me. And they were very, very, very short. Um, one basically said yes, which was a, a like a male uh, voice, no, a female voice. And the, the other one said, uh, a second voice said, please reply. And that scared me enough to pack all of my gear away for three months, six months, I can't remember now, it was years ago, and not continue doing it because I, it became... From that experience, it became very real. Up to that point, it was just fun because I thought, oh, did I hear something there? Or did... But when I physically mm-hmm. did hear something, I thought, where did that come from? Where did, where did yeah. that come from? And, and that's the fascination that still sticks with me today with EVP is where do those, are we doing it? Are, are, is in some way, are we able to 
imprint on, you know, is it our thoughts, our wishes, our wants imprinting on those devices, or is there something more going on? And as I say, the cheap devices seem to be more susceptible. Only problem is it's not very good quality. So we are then in that field of interpretation. I can record yeah, something yeah. and say, hey, Rob, what does that say? And you could say, oh, that says sausages. And I look at it and say, no, that says uh, that says uh, sawdust. It's completely different interpretation. So, you know, it's still a, it's it's, still a it's, black hole. It's funny you mentioned the tape recorder because um, I quite miss the idea of being able to use, well, I know that you can still buy old tape recorders yeah. on, on things at eBay, um, but the they're not really used much um, in terms of paranormal. A lot of people use no. the MP3 recorders yeah. now. And I've got one upstairs, one of the little, I don't know what you call them, the little things that spin Dic- around and turn Dic- the tape. Uh, like a dictaphone, Dic- like a little handheld, yeah, one, a little yeah. microcassette, yeah. Yeah, well, one of them doesn't turn, so the, the thing doesn't work now. So I'm either going to have to get it repaired or, or get a new one. But one of the best, well, I say one of the best, one of the strangest things I ever recorded was through a, a tape recorder that was, that was locked off in a in a room about 15 years ago and because it was so weird i never showed it to anyone i never played it to anyone because the first thing i think someone would say if they heard it was that's just someone messing about because it yeah. sounds ridiculous it was a it was in a, a, a building in newcastle called uh, the biscuit factory which was a it's an art museum it used to be an old factory um and beneath it You've got a basement that was used as air raid shelters during the war. It's basically like a tunnel that goes around the perimeter yeah. of the foundations of it. And now it's rented out to um, artists who've got studios down there. Um, so years ago, when we first started doing the radio show, we got permission to go and do a show from here. There was a story of a, a murder inside the building. People who stay there at night uh, working in their, their studios claim that they get things going on. So we went there, did a show, absolutely nothing happened at all. It was a boring night, but we had fun doing it anyway. And it was years later, I found this tape recorder and I thought, oh, I'll have a little listen back, see what type of things that we were recording. And I I listened back and I could hear my voice. I could hear um, the other people that were were there on the the night doing the, the ghost hunt. And you can hear me put it down on a table in the middle oh, of yeah. the base room, I think we, we left it in, and you can hear us walking away. And then you can hear us talking in the very far distance where our voices have traveled down down the corridor. And then you hear the tape stop and then it starts again, but you hear, a, and that's one of the most horrific noises. It's like a squeal. It sounds like a pig squealing. It's heavy breathing then the silence for about three seconds and then an almighty scream and then it stops again and then you hear us coming back and picking the tape up and stopping it and that tape apart from being on that investigation was never used on another investigation it was sat in a dusty cupboard that was never used so it's either something recorded on location or someone or something recorded over the top of what was on that tape and i've had it sort of copied onto mp3 format so it is on my laptop but i thought if i sent that to anybody to try and say that i've captured something paranormal they would laugh at it it sounds like the most ridiculous thing and then about a year ago i was watching um one of those tv shows in america paranormal caught on camera okay and there was a case in canada where a man was receiving voicemails on his mobile phone mm-hmm. from an unknown number, but they were strange. And he believed it was paranormal because somebody had died in the house. And he played one of the voicemails when the voice on his uh, answering on his voice machine. Oh, sorry, on his on his vo- yeah, that was a voice message that was received. Voicemail, on his phone. Yeah. He played it back. Yeah, voicemail. That's the word. And it was almost identical to the, what I had on this on this tape. And I th- I'd listened to it, and the first thing I thought, that's exactly the same type of squeal. And I'm not a one person who has any belief in you know, demonic activity. I still, I still need to be bought on that side of things. But I thought, well, that's not something that's normal. That's not a living person. 
I couldn't recreate that sound, even if I tried to, with my own vocal cord, it would just destroy my voice, my, all my chords in my throat. And I've listened to it and I thought, that's not human doing that. Mm. That's It sounds more animal than a human. And I've never, and that was, that was recorded using a, a tape. I um <clears throat> interesting you bring that up because uh, I had a guest on Hannah from Australia. She did, she does a lot of EVP work and she does a lot of um ghost tour uh stuff and they she gets into a lot of these older buildings in Australia and they were doing a um I think it was a I think it was an old prison in Australia and they were doing a night out vigil for with a group a small group of people and each they broke the person people up into groups and they put them into different rooms. One person was in a cell, one person was in a morgue, and, you know, those kind of things. And they caught a, uh, they had a recorder in, in the cell with, a, with someone else, and across the way, uh, two girls were in a, another area, and they saw an, uh, an apparition, but at the same time, they caught this, like, howling on, on the cassette recorder, the, the, the digital tape recorder, sorry, um, mm -hmm. with the, the, and you can hear the two girls in the room screaming as they see this. Well, I think it was an old woman or an apparition of an old woman appear and then disappear. Um, and she she sent me the recordings, which is on the. I'll, I'll forward it to you because it's it's similar to what you're. I, I'll be surprised you to say that's very similar because the screaming on EVPs is more common than you think it is. It it happens yeah. a lot. Uh, the, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I Maybe it's some sort of... Um, this is where I go back to my... Um, well, not mine. It's, uh, it's an opinion. It's a theory out there already. But this is where I go back to this theory where whatever it is, is it's, it's an emotional imprint. It's how they... How you... If you think about it, right? If you imprint on something, um, in, this, in this case, it's a, a chip in a device that records audio, um, if you are able to imprint on that and you're imprinting an, an emotional feeling and you're feeling frustrated and trapped and, and, and whatever and scared, maybe it would come out like that. Maybe it would come out with absolute just complete terror uh, that you're of the situation that you're in. Uh, yeah. For all we yeah. know that, you know, passing on un, unexpectedly and you end up in some sort of nightmare loop. Well, you're in, it's a dream. You feel it's a dream. It's a dream that keeps repeating, and 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 you you feel like you're trapped. And as the dream gets older and older, you become more aware that you're trapped into this sort of uh, hell, this hellish loop. More like a you, you become sort of um, awake in your like a waking dream, really. Uh, you know, the more that you become aware that you're in this kind of loop, and maybe the uh, the anguish and you know builds up and that's how it comes out who knows i don't know but anyway yeah, i'll send i'll send you it I'll yeah yeah do it. um i'd like to hear it but yeah i've never gone public with it just simply because i think i'll get ridiculed if i went if i went to the press and said have you heard this this was captured here but then i also think was it captured there or was something recorded over the tape while it's yeah. been somewhere else and i know for a fact i couldn't record it because I couldn't make that sound. I don't think any human could, but I'll send you it. Yeah. Excellent. I look forward to that. So as we're, we're coming to rapidly coming to the end of this episode, I just wanted to get a couple more questions in. I wanted to ask you okay. when you did your uh, investigation at the underground hospital. Um, and of course, you know, you, you were limited with time and stuff and you came away. What, what was the, what do you think is the best evidence that you had? Was it more personal as a personal feeling or did you actually, have something that you came away and thought, well, you know, this could be possibly something. I think the the incident I had with the spirit box was strange. Uh, for those who haven't seen the video, um, I started a spirit box session. The spirit box is plugged into an external microphone just to get a bit of extra, bit better sound quality coming through. And it shut down like midway through scanning, which the only way I can recreate that is by pressing and holding down the on off button. If you, if you know the, the PSB seven spirit box and I've tried to recreate it as I had it with in one hand, I had the, the mic, uh, the spirit box and the speaker 
And the only way you can do it is by sliding the spirit box under the speaker so that the corner of the speaker digs into the button, which I know I wouldn't have done because it felt unnatural in my hand. Um, and I was lucky enough, I didn't know it at the time, but I'll actually turn the camera around and you could see the spirit box in my hand and I wasn't holding it in that way. So that was in the three or four seconds before before it happened. Whether that was paranormal or whether that was just something shut it down, I, I don't know. Um, hmm. Usually that would be if the batteries had gone, but the batteries hadn't gone. They were, they were freshly charged batteries. Um, other than that, ITC wise, um, I was getting sounds coming through on the um, the ITC uh, device I was using that was kind of, they sounded like they were coming through in foreign languages, specifically German. That I have never used an ITC app where I've thought that sounds German, but then again, a lot of the time you use it, you're not looking out for German words, you're trying to, your brain's trying to recognize English words. And maybe I was out there trying to listen to see if I was communicating with anyone who was German, whether that was an explanation for it. Um, I did ask specifically, what nationality are you? And it did come back and it sounded to me like Czech. That was what I heard at the time. When you listen back to it through the recording, maybe it sounds a bit less like Czech. But when I was there in the situation with my ears, it sounded like it said Czech. Um, so I did reference that in the video, whether that was someone who happened to be a prisoner of war, because um, we know there were a few deaths building the complex. Mm. Um, I think in 1941, there was an explosion and there was also some French prisoners died um, in a collapse as well. Uh, so there were a few deaths sort of linked to the to the tunnels uh, from that. Whether it's paranormal, it, again, it, I think it depends on how people see the the ITC device, whether they think it's a, the voice bank is, it can be manipulated by any kind of entity or whether it is literally just a load of rubbish. I know I, I get comments all the time on YouTube, people saying, I think someone commented on a video once said you could put it in a wheelie bin and you would think the wheelie bin was haunted because it, it comes out with so much, so much sound. So <laughs> again, that's why I make the video so generic. So I do use a bit of it, but I don't overly use it. Then I'll use other techniques just so that I try and keep more people happy and it's not just using ITC apps or using just SLS cameras. But then again, if you don't use an SLS camera, you'll get people complaining and saying, oh, if you use an SLS camera, you'll see. So you try and use a, a variety just to try and show that you've tested a few yeah, different, mix it up a different bit. methods out. Yeah, yeah. Try, but, try a little bit of everything and see what works and what doesn't work. I mean, stuff, I mean, I'm not, I'm quite happy to go and sit in a room with my cheese sandwiches and a flask of coffee and a notepad and a recorder and maybe a camera and just sit there for an hour in yeah. complete silence and see how I see how I feel, see if my body reacts in any way to the environment and see what I pick up and see if anything exactly. happens. But then again, you can also have a recorder going. Any technology, it can be a benefit for to document what's going on, a camera, a video camera going, uh, anything. But it's... The problem is, is when you start to wholly rely on that equipment just to do an investigation, yeah. when it should start with you, the person, your motivation and how you feel in that environment. I know we're all fallible. Everyone's fallible. Everyone's got their, their vices about the dark or, you know, imagining stuff and that. But that's the whole point of, of, of be, being able to tune into your environment. Go there and just chill and just tune in. And once you've tuned into your environment, and then you can start to investigate. But a lot of people just rush in, running around. It's chasing me. Demon's got my arm. It's on my back. Oh, I need to get out yeah. of the door. You know, it's... <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. So uh, it, it, there's those two sides of it. But um, anyway, Rob, so quickly, uh, before I end this episode, I wanted to ask you, um, fascinating, absolutely fascinating, uh, your investigation. Video is brilliant. I'm going to put a link in the... Um, description and i advise anyone to go watch it because it is a good uh it's a it's a, it's a good um it's a good half hour spent i think it's a half hour or an hour long but it's uh it yeah, is a good investigation an um yeah. so what what have you got planned for uh the coming months because the weather's getting better and uh, it's going to get lighter and i'm sure you've got some more uh, um investigations uh, planned have you got any castles on on the list i've got a ruined castle um, it was one I recorded quite a while back, 
and it's kind of fallen down the pile because I'm 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 really bad for this. I I record something new and I, I went over did the Guernsey special um, to the prisoner of war camp. And a lot of the time I, I get really excited about, oh, that was an, an amazing place. And you, you, you're you in a rush to try and get it out. And then some of the older ones that you've recorded a few months before then end up getting pushed to the bottom of the pile. So I, I do have a, a ruined castle um, that is, it has a few stories, it has a witch linked to it, witch trial linked to it. And a um, few people say they see, experience a lot of paranormal things there. So I've been up and I've done some uh, recordings there. Um, in terms of getting out and about, I've got, um, fingers crossed, I'm hoping May I'm going to get back out uh, abroad again. I've found a possibly a another one uh, from the content creator box just ticked straight away as soon as I started reading stories. I found a, a location that I'm really, really researching at the minute that I think would make a, a powerful video. So that's kind of in the pipeline at the minute. Um, in terms of the next few things, in fact, the next one I'm going to probably put up on the channel is a castle, uh, castle keep in Newcastle. Oh, um, place I saw my first ever what I believe is an apparition um, years ago. So I'm going back in there, trying to recreate the scene, trying to recreate the environment I was in, see if uh, we can catch it again. Awesome. That sounds uh, something to look forward to. I uh, yeah. That one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I, I love all that. All castles and stuff. Love it. Love the history. I know it's. Uh, some of it's quite gory and it's it's quite depressing, but just going into those places yeah. and knowing that, you know, there's hundreds of years of history is here and you can touch the same walls and bricks and walk up the same steps that people did in the past, I think it's just mind-blowing. But uh, also a bit sad as well because uh, not everybody went into a castle, came out of a castle. They might have ended up down a hole, exactly. you know, yeah. but, you know. Yeah. Uh, that was then and this is now. But anyway, thanks everybody for listening. Thanks for, again, Rob. Um, I'm sure that... Uh, thanks I'd for say, having me. That's quite all right. Um, I needed to get you on because I watched your episode and I thought, got to get him on because I want to talk about this. Um, and I thought my listeners, uh, you know, need to know about this as well because it's, uh, it, you know, it, I like I like watching investigations done in that kind of way where it's like a man and his camera. Uh, I like that because it's uh, yeah. kind of drags you in a little bit no none of this kind of crazy music i just keep it simple that's the best way keep it simple and uh that's you know that's the best way for me but anyway um yeah so uh great with your investigations i'm sure you'll be back on i've got some live streams starting soon so gonna get you on uh I'm trying to do with like a little bit of a rang table i'll hopefully get you on there and get your sort of input onto an episode uh, i'm not sure when but i'm kind of trying to figure it out with everyone but um i hope everybody enjoyed this episode and obviously you know, there'll be more para talk soon um, but uh, until then, take care. Talk to you soon. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.